Hallelujah. The psalmist said that he is enthroned on the praises of his people. You ever thought about when you're worshiping, you're building a throne for our Father, for our King? And the question is, what kind of throne does it look like if it's built on our worship? May our worship forever be passionate and so honoring to build the throne for our God. So glad you're here this morning. It's the start of a new series about the Jesus you never knew. So why didn't you know him? Why didn't we know him? I think it's simple. I think, number one, I think Jesus has gotten bad press. You think Trump has bad press? Listen, <laughs> Jesus has gotten terrible press. Why is that? Who's the on, what's the only representation of him? We are. I mean, think about it. People look at us. And so they form an opinion about Jesus. We do the same thing. And so we see in somebody's life. And the unfortunate thing is his children don't always look like him. And so people grow up with this idea of Jesus, and it's all wrong when you look at the biblical record. Or maybe it's her tradition. I think a lot of people have an opinion of Jesus based on Christmas music. I mean, think about it. The songs we sing, like We Three Kings of Orion are. We, we're no, how do we know there were three kings? We don't know there were three. There might have been a bunch of kings. There might have been one. But we have heard songs and we've heard things in our traditions that have influenced the way we see him. Well, what if our traditions are wrong? What if this word is different than what our traditions? Well, that's why we're going to open the pages of this book because guess what? This book is the truest picture of Jesus there is. Not our tradition, but his word. And then I think there's a part of us, all of us want Jesus to be like us. I mean, think about it. We all kind of think he was like, uh, oh, he was like me. He's a white guy. No, he wasn't. Can I show you pictures of Jesus around the world? These are actual depictions of Jesus around the world. Look at that. Now, when you see them, isn't it interesting that if you're in Korea, he looks Korean. If you're in Russia, he looks Russian. And, and right on. And this is the one I grew up with, down in the corner, the bottom right corner. That's the one. I saw it in Sunday school rooms. I saw it on people's coffee tables. It was on a Bible one time. I saw a family Bible, had that picture. So in my mind, I thought that was what Jesus looked like. I thought, wow, who got that photograph? That's really a good photograph. <laughs> the lighting was just right. Everything was great. So Jesus was still for a moment. I mean, it's a nice picture. But see, he wasn't like us. He was Middle Eastern. He was Hebrew, right? I mean, he, he was a Hebrew. He was a man that grew up in the Middle East. And so the question is not, <laughs> was Jesus like us? The question ought to be, how much like him are we? Because that's the call of God on every one of us, to be like him. Not in physical appearance. When it can, we can't change our physical appearance. In fact, I used to tell my dad he had long hair. I said, Dad, it's okay to have long hair. Jesus had long hair. And you know the line that followed that. Yeah, and Jesus walked everywhere he went. So, you know, you don't get a car. <laughs> so I gave up on that argument early on. But Mark, the gospel writer, wants to present Jesus to us. And he wants us to give us a glimpse of Jesus, not according to tradition, not according to all the presuppositions we bring to the text, but, but just in honest, here he is. And so let's talk about Mark for a moment. In fact, get your Bible. Go to, go to the, the, uh, the Gospel of Mark. As you turn there, you probably got one of these cards on the way in. You didn't get one of these cards? There should be one in a seat back. Somebody look in a seat back and, and hand that up on the front there. If you, if you didn't get one, every weekend, my goal is that we learn something about Jesus we didn't know. We learn at least one thing about Jesus we didn't know. And my goal is to write it down in the service. Because that way, our mind is open. We don't come in here with a closed mind saying, all right, I didn't know about Jesus. I know everything there is to know about Jesus. No, we don't. 
In fact, I'm going to tell you today, I learned something about him in, in preparing. And there's a text we're going to be in in just a second. It, it just blew my mind. It just opened up a world to me. And I mean, I've taught New Testament. I've, I've taught this, and I've believed this, and followed this. But I believe that he is constantly revealing. The Holy Spirit is revealing Jesus every time we open the pages of Scripture. So the questions I want you to answer is, what, what's something I've learned about Jesus? And then what difference does that make in my life? And there's some directions on the back if you want to use it, and I encourage you to in social media. I think it'd be awesome because I think it gives the witness to others that, hey, you know what? I'm learning about him, and, and he's showing me who he really is. And there are things every week that I learn about him. So Mark is the gospel we're going to use. Who was Mark? He probably wasn't an eyewitness. He was probably a young man that grew up in the home of devout followers of Jesus. In Jerusalem. We know that Mark's mom was one of the leaders in the early church. Now here's what's fascinating. There's a possibility that the upper room where Jesus broke bread with his disciples, the Last Supper, might have been in Mark's house, the home of his parents. John Mark, as he's also known, I believe is the one who went on the missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. He was Barnabas' cousin. And he turned and went back after the first uh, little bit of the trip. And remember the second trip they were going to go on, Barnabas brought him and Paul said, no, I'm not going with him. He left us the first time. We're not, he's not going this time. And so Paul went one way and Barnabas and Mark probably went to, to Crete and ministered there. But at the end of Paul's life, remember he asked for Mark. He wanted John Mark to come to him because he said he was useful to him. I believe that John Mark is that guy. And he, in Rome, was writing to encourage the church. To encourage the church. Now let me, let me follow up on what I, what I mean by that. When Nero became the Caesar of Rome, he became the Caesar about 54 A.D. He was the Caesar until 68 A.D. In that period of time, Nero was unmerciful to Christians, especially in the 60s. He's the one that beheaded Paul. He's the one that killed Peter. He was unmerciful. So the church, can you imagine if you were the church in Rome? And we know there was a good church there, a big church, because of the book of Romans that was written to that church in Rome. Can you imagine what those Christians felt like? Man, you get beat up by the government. You're under the threat of your life. You just are persecuted by everyone. And I believe Mark wanted to write the story of Jesus, the good news, because he wanted to encourage those Christians. And the reason that I believe that is because Mark is the one gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the only one that presents Jesus more as the suffering Son of God and he also gives one-third of the book. One-third of the gospel is the last few days of Jesus' life, the suffering of Jesus. And I just think the reason he did that is because he wanted to encourage Christians. So let me just say, if there's anybody in this room, anybody that's listening, going through a difficult season, you're going through a really hard time, you've said goodbye to people you love, you've walked through persecution yourself, or maybe you're struggling just with health issues or whatever it is, this is your gospel. And you will see glimpses of the suffering Son of God who came for you. And I just think it's a beautiful picture to encourage those Christians. And the point of what he's writing is this, here's the good news. That's how he opens it. Look at the very first verse. The beginning of the gospel, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That, I mean, it's not even a complete sentence. He just says, here it is. Here is the good news. Did you know that the word gospel is not often used by the gospels when they write them? It's not common. He uses it to say, here's an announcement. Here's somebody I want to introduce you to. I have good news for you. The word actually wasn't necessarily Christian. The Romans used it. When a Caesar was coming to town or a king or a leader was coming to town, they would send a messenger and, and he would announce through what's called the gospel, the good news. We have a king coming. Well, Mark took that word 
And he says to every one of us who read it today, I got good news. I want to show you a king has come. And he begins his gospel by saying the beginning of the gospel. And then he presents Jesus, the real Jesus. Now, Mark did not use Wikipedia. He did not use Google. He had nothing available to him, as none of them did. So how do you present somebody when they may not know who you're talking about? What you do is you use references. You present people who knew this person. And so it's through the connection that you kind of present it. Let me give you the best analogy I know. How many of you have ever filled out a resume? You've done a resume. Raise your hand. Did you include references on your resume? Raise your hand. There you go. You did the same thing he does. You use references to help people understand who you are, right? And it does. It helps. Some references aren't as helpful as others. For example, here's a reference letter. I'm not going to tell you the lady's name. God forbid she could have distant family in this church. And so I don't want to tell you her name. To whom it may concern, I have employed Miss So-and-so for three long years. I'm very enthusiastic to recommend her for a new position of any capacity with any business. Whatever it is, she will be fantastic at it. While employed here, Miss So-and-so has displayed great ability in the use of social media, audio and visual media, and text messaging, not to mention telephonic skills with a variety of non-employment related parties. (laughs) She is punctual on the days that she comes in on time (laughs) and always comes in first place in office departure. If there's anything further that I can do to facilitate her being hired, including personally driving her to her new employment, please, please let me know. Now, I don't think that was necessarily a good recommendation, right? How about these statements from actual reference letters? Since my last report, this employee has reached rock bottom and now shows signs of starting to dig. His men would follow him anywhere, but only out of a morbid curiosity. I would not allow this employee to breed. That's not good. This associate is really not so much of a has-been, but more of a definitely will never be. He would be out of his depth in a parking lot puddle. This young lady has delusions of adequacy. So, (laughs) just suffice it to say, references matter. So, what does Mark do? He starts with references. And he picks three. And he says, let me tell you who knows him. As I share the good news of Jesus, let me tell you first about a prophet, Isaiah. Then let me tell you about John the Baptist and what John the Baptist said of him. And then the third one is the biggest of all. Let me tell you about one day when a voice came from heaven and spoke of him. So start with me, verse 2. The first reference, Isaiah. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now everybody who would would have read this originally knew who Isaiah was. They knew the Old Testament. The Old Testament is one of the big anchors for them in their understanding of God. So he starts with Isaiah the prophet and says, hey, this Isaiah knew him. And Isaiah said there was going to be a messenger that was going to come and prepare the way for him. So really what Isaiah the prophet is saying is he's saying John the Baptist is coming and he's preparing the way for the Lord. So let's move to the second reference, John the Baptist. Verse 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So who was John? Well, he was a man who came from the wilderness. 
who had a message. And it was a message of, you got to get ready. You need to get ready because somebody's coming. And he preached the message of repentance to prepare the way of the Lord. And so as people would come to him, he would invite them to be baptized if they had indeed repented and confessed their sins, and he would baptize them. And, and look at his popularity. People were coming from all over Judea, all over Jerusalem. Now, there was something about John as he's out there saying, get ready, get ready. There's somebody coming. You need to get ready. Be baptized. Now, his baptism was not like our baptism. His baptism was one of preparation. In other words, get ready for someone who is coming. Our baptism is one of declaration saying, look who's already come, and I am one of his, and I'm following him. So this baptism was to get you ready, and it was after you confessed sin, and everybody was coming to him. That's an amazing. I've stood where John was. I've stood where we believe he baptized. There's not much there. I mean, I'd show you a picture, but it's just a little stream and, um, and it doesn't really have a whole lot to, uh, to make you think it was a big, big popular area. In fact, you had to be going to this place to go there. You don't go by it. It's not on the way anywhere. It's just at a place in the River Jordan. So why were people coming? Well, some people think it's because he looked crazy. I mean, everybody thinks about John the Baptist. They go, man, that guy was crazy. He was weird. Came out of the desert. And look what he wears in the next verse. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. I mean, let's admit, that's a little strange. I promise you, if somebody walks in here and they've got camel's hair on and they got a bowl of locusts and a little jar of honey and the leather belt around them, we got security that will be tending to them quickly. <laughs> wow, they just look weird. But in that day, it wasn't weird. See, for us, it's strange. We want to make John the Baptist out to be some freak. No. He was simply a nomad, meaning he lived in the wilderness. He lived out there. Some people think he was an Essene. The Essenes was a religious group that broke away from all the other religious groups like Sadducees, Pharisees, Herodians, and all those zealots, broke away, and they went to the desert because they believed they had to separate themselves from the world, and they had very strict beliefs. They had ritual baptisms, and some think that's where John got the idea of baptism. I don't think John was an Essene. I think he believed some of the same things. But you see, I think John was one of those prophets that God raises up for such a time as this. And the reason he wore those clothes is just because that's where he lived. He lived in the desert. Nomads wear that kind of clothing. I had a guy come last night at the end of the service, and he said, Pastor, I just want you to know I love to eat locusts. Man, I took a step back, and I'm thinking a prophet is among us. I don't know what to do with this guy. He said, oh, I like locusts. They're good. I said, well, that's great. Can I offer you some honey with it? I mean, what, what else do you say? I believe people came because of his message. His message was somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. And this person that's coming is bigger than I ever will be. This person that is coming, I can't even, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. So look at the next verse when it talks about that. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So let me just say this. John's whole life was consumed with one thing. Jesus is coming. Get ready for Jesus. Jesus is coming. Prepare the way. His baptism pointed to that. Everything he proclaimed pointed to that. Do you remember, and we don't get all this detail in Mark, but if you read some of the other Gospels, there was a day where John the Baptist saw Jesus, and this is what he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There was another moment where it's recorded where John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, He must increase, I must decrease. You know what amazes me about that John the Baptist? He never forgot who he was. He never took glory from Jesus. John realized he had one purpose on this earth, get people ready for Jesus. 
point people to Jesus. Can I just encourage us all? That's a great way to live your life. In fact, that's the reason we're here. The reason you have breath this morning, the reason he has given you life is to point people to him. You are not the light. He is the light. We simply reflect that light. So I just think that John the Baptist is this perfect example of what our life should be consumed with. And may we never take glory from him. I think about my own life. I'm, I'm convicted. That's one of the things I wrote on my card is I'm afraid there are times in my life I've pointed people to something different. I've pointed them to a church. I've pointed them to a man. I've even pointed them to me unknowingly. And I just believe that our life consists of a witness to Jesus Christ. That's who we are. That's all we will ever be. And we say to the world, he's coming. Get ready. You need to know him. And so here's John as a witness, and he uses John's witness. And he says, by the way, he, I baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with fire. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And you remember when that moment happened. I believe it happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. And there were tongues of fire resting on each of them. I believe only Jesus can do that. I believe the day Jesus came in your life, he baptized you with power. He came in with power. Jesus doesn't come weak, guys. He comes strong. He brings it all. When you have Jesus in your life, you have everything you need. So that moment that he walked in your life, he did something baptism can't do for you. Yeah, John can baptize you with water. I can baptize you with water, but only Jesus can baptize you with power from on high. And that's the message of John. Now, the last witness is actually Jesus' baptism. So look at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now let's just stop there because Mark didn't tell us anything about this moment other than what happened at his baptism. You remember when Jesus came to John, John goes, no, I'm not worthy to baptize you. I mean, what would you do? If the one you've been proclaiming and the one you've been pointing to and the one that you knew was the hope of the world comes up to you and goes, would you baptize me? I would do what John did. I'm I'm not worthy. And then Jesus said something in Matthew. He said, no, John, you need to because it fulfills righteousness. What does that mean? Well, let's just talk about it for a minute. When Jesus was baptized... He wasn't baptized because he had just gotten saved. Can we agree to that? Okay. He was not baptized because he believed in Jesus. He was Jesus. Let's keep everything straight here. All right. So his baptism wasn't because he had been lost. Now he was saved. So what was it? It was for us. He said it fulfills righteousness. You know what that word fulfills means? It's fitting. It's what righteous people do. It's what shows the world righteousness. So what Jesus did for us is give us a great example. That's why I say if you're a follower of Christ and you've never been baptized, you have to do what righteous people do. That's what God calls us to, is to give the witness. So on that day in May, what is that, May 7th, I believe, we're going to be baptizing all up and down the coastline of Florida as a witness to righteousness. It's just going to be a demonstration by all of us that, you know what, we're not ashamed of him. So if you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you, do what righteous people do. Be baptized. Amen? So Jesus was baptized. Now, watch what happens. When he comes up out of the water, see, I think Jesus was immersed because of the verb and the language of that. When he comes up out of the water, you go under the water is a picture of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. He did this kind of pointing to what would happen later. He comes up, and when he came up, he looked up, and he saw something that has never happened in terms of this kind of moment. Read it with me, verse 10. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. Circle the word torn being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven, you are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. That never has happened. 
What are you talking about? When he looked up, he saw the heavens torn. Now, there's some other words Mark could have used, like separated, parted, unzipped. I mean, you know, think about all the words that he could have used. He uses the most violent word. See, if something is separated, you can put it back together. But when it's torn apart, it's torn. And it's a word that means literally the heavens were just ripped apart. Now, why is that significant? Let me show you what the prophets prayed for. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. It was in the heart and mind of the Jews that one day God was going to send himself. He was coming. And God was coming to the rescue. And so this idea that God would rend the heavens, that's the same word, by the way, when the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, he tore the heavens open. Why? So that God could come to our rescue. When did he do it? When Jesus was baptized. It was his declaration, I have come to save the day. So for any of you in this room, you've had this prayer, God, I need you to show up. God, I just need you. You probably even said something like this. I just need you to rip the heavens apart and come and show up. Well, let me just give you the good news today of Mark. He has already come. His name is Jesus. And do you know where else that word occurs? That word occurs in the gospel when it says in the temple there was a veil. And when Jesus died, you remember what happened to the veil? It was unzipped. No. It was torn apart. Same word. So get this picture, guys. The heavens were torn apart. Why? So God could come down to us. And the veil was torn apart. Why? So you and I could come to him. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. What an awesome picture. Now, Joshua had parted the River Jordan. Elijah the prophet had parted the River Jordan. Elisha had parted the River Jordan. But no one had parted the heavens and torn them asunder. Only Jesus Christ. So today... My God came for me. In that moment, I see him as Jesus stands there. Now, the, the, the dove, the dove descends. Now, we say dove. It says, like a dove. I, I'm, I'm probably going to disappoint some of you. I don't know that the Holy Spirit looks like a dove. I think it descended like a dove, which may be fluttering or whatever. But I'm trying to make sure you don't think doves are Holy Spirits. A lady came to me one time and said, Pastor, don't kill a dove. Why? Well, you'd be killing the Holy Spirit. Now, if that's the case, I got a lot of Holy Spirit in my backyard. Man, I, I watch it all the time. And if that's the case, my cat killed the Holy Spirit in the backyard. I found a bunch of feathers the other day, and I told Rachel it had to be a dove. I mean, the, the, the Holy Spirit's been killed. Now, I just, I need you to know, it could be looking like a dove, but it may not be. But here's the point. The Holy Spirit came and rested on him. And then a voice from heaven came. And what did the voice say? This is my son. I want you to take that line. It's in verse 8. Uh, excuse me, verse uh, 11. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. Draw a line right there. With you I'm well pleased. On the front side of that line that we drew, this is my beloved son, that's a quote from Psalm 2. Sometime go read that psalm, Psalm 2. It's an enthronement psalm. It's a psalm that the Jews would sing, getting ready one day for their king to be enthroned, for their king to be crowned. It's a beautiful psalm. So remember that it's an enthronement. The king has come. The other part of that verse, the back side of that line, with you I am well pleased. That's a quote from Isaiah 42 which is about a suffering servant of God. Now watch this. Never in the Old Testament had this happened. In one moment with God speaking, he put together two pictures. Our king has come, 
And he has come to suffer as a servant. And in that one moment, he is presented as our Savior. He is our King. But he came to suffer for us so that we might have life and life everlasting. So this morning, this is the gospel, that the heavens were torn asunder. Our God has come down, and he has walked among us, and he is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and he has suffered for us so that we could know him, and we could be spending the rest of our days pointing people to him. That's the good news that Mark wants you to know. So here's what I want to do for a moment. Write down one thing that you learned about Jesus. One thing that touched you. One thing that kind of jumped out at you. I'll go ahead and tell you what mine was. I never saw that word torn. I never realized what God did on that day when he tore the heavens and came down. Whatever it is that you learned could be that, could be something else. Just write it down right now. And then I want you to go on and write, what is the difference it makes in my life? What, what is it that I need to do differently, or how does this change my life? Let's take just a minute and, and write on that card. share something else I wrote did you know there is never another time in biblical history when the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit were all made manifest to man in other words where man could see or hear but at the baptism of Jesus and I want you to see this picture. There's Jesus the Son standing in the River Jordan. The Holy Spirit comes. And then the Father speaks. And that one moment in time in all of creation, there is our God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you know what, for me, it lets me know baptism is a big deal. It matters. It's a really big deal. What else I wrote, I'm afraid I have, like many, not realized that I'm to be like John the Baptist. Now let me just confess, if, any, if you ever run, run into a Baptist and he says, oh, we come straight from John the Baptist, that is not the case. That is not true. We like to claim it. It's not where we came from. But I need to realize my life should be just like his in this way. I'm here for one reason. Point people to Jesus. He must increase. I must decrease. You know why? Because I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I don't know how God spoke to you, but let's just take a moment right now and thank Him, Father, for Your Word, for Your witness, and for the Gospel of Mark. Thank You for revealing to us our Savior. And I pray that whatever it is You've spoken to us through the Holy Spirit, God, we walk out of here now, and it makes a difference in the way we live our life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Hey, everyone, stand with me. As we stand together, there's a, there's a phrase out of Psalm 2. And I just, I want you to go read Psalm 2 sometime. It's just an amazing psalm because it talks about the king and the anointed of the Lord. And, and, and it has a line in there. Let the peoples be warned. Let the nations fear. 
serve the Lord with fear. Serve the Lord. Kiss the Son. It's one of the craziest phrases. Kiss the Son. What does that mean? This is my beloved Son. With Him I am pleased. To kiss the Son means I worship Him. It means I live for Him. It means I bow down to Him. It means I will do everything I do for Him. So today, because of all that He has done for us, we're going to, this song, we're just going to sing it as we go out. But before we sing, this song is simple. Jesus, I love you. I want to kiss the Son. I want to do everything I can for Him. Before we sing it, can we just say to our Savior who came for us, tore the heavens asunder, that we might be saved. Can we praise him right now? Can you give him thanks and praise him?